Well, we're coming out of a week of having the flu at our house, so I'm not contagious, but it's good the front row's clear. Um, so today we want to talk about love, and I want you to think what's, what's uh, some of the crazy things maybe you've done because of love. I, I remember when uh, Shell and I were first dating, and uh, I wanted to impress her father as much as I could, and uh, I remember they were getting ready to go on vacation, and <coughs> he asked me if I would take care of their chickens. I said, of course I'll take care of your chickens. I have no idea how you take care of chickens, but you know what? I like your daughter a lot. I will take care of your chickens. And he says, well, one thing that you need to know, uh, if by chance one of the chickens dies, and don't, don't be surprised, it happens, but if a chicken dies, I need you to bury that chicken like about three feet deep. He says, because I've got wild dogs around here, and I just it needs to be down deep, and so they won't dig them up and make a mess. I was like, I can do that. I'll handle that. So I remember they left, and it was my first morning to go take care of chickens. And I opened up the chicken house, which I, just, I didn't know how bad chickens smelled until <laughs> I opened up the chicken house. And there, out of the hundred laying hens or feeder hens, whatever he had, 50 of them were dead. I know. And I was like, I gotta bury all these stupid, stinking chickens. See the things we do for love. And I spent my Saturday not just digging a hole, but like a pit, a mass burial site of, for chickens. That's how much, though, I love my wife. Dear, I'd still dig a pit for you and crawl in it. <laughs> so. Listen, she's been through plenty of pits with me. It's okay. We're experienced pit dwellers sometimes, right? Um, but it's just one of those things that we do for, for love. And I imagine many of you have some just good stories about things that you did because of, of someone that you loved and you wanted to show that expression. And, and uh, today we're talking about love. We're going we're gonna to look at love maybe in a, in a different light than, than as we've just come through Valentine's Day. But I think it's going to be more of a, a picture of reality many times when it, when it comes to love and, and our hearts and, and the things of our hearts and that which we, we seek. We've, we've been in the Old Testament. We're in Genesis. We're going to go back to, to Genesis. If you want to go ahead and just open your Bibles there, I'm just going to kind of <coughs> do a little bit of a overview here. I'm going to be kind of around verse or chapter 27 in Genesis. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, look under the seat in front of you. Uh, if you need a Bible, please take that one. And Genesis, it's, it's easy to find. It's the very first book in your Bible. And so just kind of open up around 26, 27 in there. Just to give you a little bit of background, we've been talking about Abraham. And last week we looked at Abraham and Isaac. And basically the journey of faith that Abraham has been on. And so kind of give you the family tree, kind of bring you up to speed. We had Abraham and Sarah had their son Isaac, remember Abraham was like 90, no, 100 years old. Sarah was 90 when they had him. So uh, he's that promised son, uh, the son of the covenant. And so then Isaac marries uh, Rebekah, and she has twins, Esau and Jacob. And as we just read through this story there in those chapters, you'll see that when, when they're first married, um, Isaac prays that his wife can, can have a child, and, and lo and behold, she's, she's pregnant. And she's just not pregnant, she's like massively pregnant. She's got twins, and, and like she'd walk down the road and her stomach would throw her to the side, you know, and she's just like, what's going on with this? And she seeks the Lord, and, and he says what every mother-to-be wants to hear, you have two nations at war within you. It's like, oh... I'm so happy, <laughs> right? But he says, he says in the midst of that, that the older will serve the younger. He's already expressing what he knows is going to transpire here. So she, in fact, has twins. She has 
Esau. And as you read the story of the birth, when Esau is born, it says he came out covered in red hair like he was wrapped in a cloak. That would just freak me out. It just would. He was covered in hair. So this is about the closest thing I could find, you know. I know, you just want a piece of duct tape, don't you? Just <laughs> uh, but yeah, just, and so his name Esau means red and hairy, all right? I mean, what else do you call a kid that comes out like that? What do we call him? I don't know, about red and hairy, all right? Esau. So his name was, was Esau, and Esau <coughs> was Isaac's favorite, right? <laughs> it's like he just wanted that little pet, you know, that he never got to have, and here's his son who's all furry, right? Uh, Esau in English means chia, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, right? But, but he was, by far, he was Isaac's favorite. He, he hunted. He, he was kind of the man's man. He not only hunted, he barbecued, right? And Isaac loved a good barbecue. And so uh, Esau would go out getting food, fix his dad his favorite meals. And so he was by far the favorite. Now, Jacob, on the other hand, was obviously, and he knew this, was not his father's favorite. He recognized his father far preferred his, his older brother. And so Jacob and ends up becoming very resentful. Uh, he is kind of the opposite of his brother. He likes to stay indoors. He likes to cook. Uh, he takes baths, unlike his brother. Uh, you know, he's just kind of the opposite. And he also uh, becomes the favorite of his mother. So you've got parents who have obvious favorites in the family, which if you know or have experience, that causes real problems and issues. And so it does, in fact, the same thing here. It causes these issues. And Jacob becomes very uh, devious. Uh, when the boys are born, uh, when, they, when Esau comes out, Jacob, in fact, has a hold of his brother's heel. So his name means heel grabber. And it's like he's going to hold on to his brother. And there's going to be this competition. And so uh, Jacob becomes very devious and, and shifty in his ways. And so now if we look at chapter 27, what you see happening here is where Isaac now is going to give the blessing, basically, of the firstborn. And this is a one-time thing. You can't do this multiple times, okay? This is like a one-shot deal. And so Esau is his favorite, so he tells Esau, go out, catch me some of, catch me some of my favorite game, <coughs> barbecue for me, man, bring it here, and I'm going to bless you. And what we read is that Rebecca overhears this, and she tells Jacob, she's like, go get a couple baby goats, and I'll cook them up like your father likes them. She does that, and then she goes, and she gets Esau's clothes, and she puts it on Jacob, and then she lays goat skin on him. Goat, like a goat fur, so that Isaac will think that it's Esau. Isn't that something? Like you have to put a fur on so your dad thinks it's your brother. And then the smell I'm just like, so his brother was hairy like a goat and smelled like a goat, right? It's like, hey, guess who I am? I'm my brother. You know, take a big whiff, right? And so he pulls off the deception. He pulls off the deception, and Esau is so embittered towards his brother that he vows that, you know, he's going to kill him. In fact, once their father is dead, he's going to take his brother out. And his, the mom hears about this, and so she tells Isaac. She doesn't tell him what Esau's going to do. She just says, you know what, you need to send your son uh, to my family because he needs to find a bride. And so Isaac sends Jacob out with his blessing. And so we pick it up here in 29, and it, it's interesting. With all Jacob's deception and everything, he, he ends up leaving home with nothing, I mean, he did the, he pulled the whole firstborn uh, devious plan plot so that he could get, because the firstborn also got the major portion of the inheritance. And he pulls that off, but he ends up leaving with nothing. So we find him in chapter 29 then. 
It says, Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. So he's finally coming to the, to the territory where his mother's family uh, lives. And he's not sure if he's there yet. He's hanging out at a, at a well with some other shepherds. And they're kind of chit-chatting. And he's like, do you know my uncle Laban? And they're like, uh, yeah. And they're like, is he doing good? Yeah, he's doing good. And they're just talking about stuff. And they're like, oh, here comes. Here comes his daughter, Rachel. And he sees Rachel. And this is a love at first sight. And oh, my goodness. This girl is like drop-dead gorgeous. And in fact, the, the well itself, it says, it tells us there, is the well's covered with this huge rock. And all the shepherds are waiting for all the other shepherds to get around because they're all going to lift this rock and uncover the well. Jacob sees Rachel, and he goes over, and he moves the rock himself. How you doing, right? <laughs> Let me just move this rock for you, right? Now, I've, I've got to walk you through something here. It's going to kind of maybe pop a bubble, give you a complete different picture of this story of romance. All right. Um, let me just toss the ages out because I know what you're thinking. Here's a young guy, young girl. They're in love, right? It's the way it rolls. Um, okay, so Rachel and Leah in this story, we know that they're somewhere between 14 and 18 because they're in that bracket to marry, probably closer to 18 because um, Rachel's out as a shepherdess by herself with the sheep. So that was a big responsibility with the family's treasures, so to speak. <coughs> Jacob. Jacob is 77. Okay, I know, you're just like, ooh, all right, he, he's 77. Now, let me just repackage this for you. So, 77 in this time in this culture is uh, middle age, all right? He's going to live to be about 150, so he's kind of at about the halfway point. So, you might say he's closer to maybe like a 45-year-old man by today's standard, and you're still going, ooh, <laughs> you know, and Rachel, he's so excited. Not only is she gorgeous and beautiful, but she is his first cousin. I know. Ooh. The oohs just keep building, right? But, but he's like, this is awesome. This because back then, you know, they married family. That's what they did. They married family. But he is head over heels for this young girl. He is all, or she is all he can think about. I mean, he goes back, he meets, he meets Laban, he, he stays with Laban for a month. If you look over here in verse 15 uh, of chapter 29, he's been with Laban for a month, and, and Laban recognizes that, that Jacob is, you know, he does good as a shepherd, and, and he's a great manager, and so that's why he says, because uh, you're my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Jacob knows right off the bat, one word, Rachel, I want her, I want Rachel, I will, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll work for her for seven years, seven years, yep, I'll do it for seven years, can I have her, can I, can I, can I, right, and, and Laban's like, I got this guy, he is completely gone, and, and we know that, that Jacob is so lovesick, if we look down here, look at, look at verse 20, after he greased for the seven years, it says, So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Right? It's like love is blind. Whew. Man, those seven years, whew. I'm so excited. But, but let me show you the obsession even more. Look at verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. All right? I don't think I have to go into detail what that means, that I may go into her. I mean, here's a man. The reason this is in the text, and I will tell you right up front that, that uh, the rabbis through history who have taught this text have such a problem with this one passage because what he says how he says it 
is such an affront. It is just like in your face. And the reason it's included here is, is because <clears throat> they're wanting us to see, Scripture's wanting us to see how deeply obsessed Jacob is with Rachel and possessing her and just having her physically. This is all he's thought about. And this is where his mind is. See, see Jacob, think about this. I, I told you, he's, he's 77, so he's no spring chicken. He spent many years at home in a situation and a life where he recognized he was not the favorite. He resented the fact that his father always played to his brother. Whatever his brother want, that's what his dad would do. He resented that. He, he's always been under the protection of a very overbearing mother who wanted to make sure that her son knew how special and loved he was, and that, so she just hovered over him all the time. Now for his, the first time, for the first time he's out away from his dad, his mom, his brother, he's on his own. He's left home, he has nothing, and all of a sudden he sees this beautiful girl. He knows he needs a wife, and man... How awesome is this? Not only is she my family, but she is gorgeous. And if I can have her, that'll fix everything. Anybody ever have a relationship where you thought, man, if I can just, man, if I can just find that person, if I can just find that guy, if I can just find that girl, you're going to be like the Jerry Maguire movie. You complete me. Right? I mean, that, that's his hope. That's his desire. That's what he's doing. That's, that's where he's putting basically all his eggs into that basket. If he could just possess her. Basically, it's that same he's seen that all of the longing that he has, all the longings that all of us have, right? For that security, that sense of belonging, that, that longing uh, <coughs> to, to have purpose. He has those same things, and he, and he sees that these will all be fulfilled if he can just marry and possess this gorgeous, gorgeous woman. Here's the reality. Anytime we are looking to have um, fulfillment like that, and we are looking for that to complete us in someone else, like in a relationship or in uh, a job or making more money, uh, anytime we, we are looking for that kind of fulfillment, any place other than in knowing God, it's going to lead to heartache and devastation. And, and it's just going to be destructive in our life. And, and it's just it's so devastating. And, and in Jacob's life, that devastation is going to help be ushered in by his uncle Laban. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about Laban. Jacob is deceptive. Have you ever been around someone who's deceptive? I mean, a lot of politicians are. I mean, just the reality. You, you have to listen very closely to what they're saying, because they'll say things, but they may not say the whole thing. You understand that type of individual? It's like they have a motive, they have a plan. And, and Jacob is this kind of guy. Laban puts Jacob to shame. He is like even more deceptive and devious. This man is like the Jedi master of it all, right? And, and so when he comes, he's already got things rolling in mind, what he's going to do. And so when he comes in verse 15 and says, you know, because you're my kinsman, should you serve me for nothing? Tell me, tell me what shall your, your wage be? <coughs> he recognizes Jacob is lovesick for Rachel. And so when he suggests, when Jacob suggests seven years, he's like, I think we can do, we can work with that. Okay. Um, now just so you know, at this time in this culture, they had what's called a bride's price. Okay. So the bride's price was basically about two years wages, guys. All right. Two years wages, right? You, and uh, that's what you paid your father-in-law to be. 
So I was looking, so for like here today, rural Indiana, uh, you might be looking at a bride's price of forty, forty-five thousand dollars $45,000, right? Not a little sum, right? I'm going to be talking to my son-in-laws afterwards. Um, <laughs> You know, it was about forty, forty-five thousand, um, and that's what they would pray so or pay. Now, Jacob, if you can imagine, that's about what the going rate is. That's kind of what Laban would expect as they begin to talk about marriage. Jacob, off the bat, is like, "I'll pay you one hundred sixty thousand dollars." So we're going from forty thousand to like one hundred sixty thousand. I think we can work with that. I think we can do that. And you know what's interesting here? When, when Jacob proposes this, Laban never says yes. Oh, you got to watch that. He never says, yes, you should marry Rachel. He's more like, that's a good idea. In fact, what, what is his response? In verse 19, Laban said, you know, it, it's better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. So he never says yes. He doesn't say no. See, this guy you got to watch. And then come the wedding, then comes the wedding banquet, and he even dresses Rachel up as the bride. And yet, he's got a plan. The man's got a plan. And we see that unfold in, in verse 25. And in the morning... Behold, it was Leah. You can kind of underline that. That is like at the heart of this story. In the morning, it was Leah. Jacob is beside himself. He cannot... I don't know if any of you had a bad honeymoon. I don't think it's going to top this bad honeymoon story. I got married... <laughs> I woke up, I, I married my wife's sister. I mean, she's not my wife. Now my, never mind, it's just bad. And he's so, he's so furious, he's so upset. And, and <clears throat> he says, what is this? He goes to Laban, he says, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Oh, someone deceived him. Interesting. Look at what Laban, look at Laban's response. Laban said, it's not done so, or so done in our country to, get, or country to give the younger before the firstborn. In other words, you know, Jacob, I know your story, and I know how um, you're all about putting the second before the first. We don't do it that way here, son. Now, you know the thing that you notice here? There's no comeback for Jacob. He didn't say anything. Why is that? Because he just recognized he got deceived in the same way that he deceived his father. And in fact, when he says, uh, why have you deceived me? That, that word deceived there is the same word that's used back in, in chapter 27 when he deceives Isaac. So see, when we have these kind of things sown in our lives, like deception, and we're a deceptive person, God will allow others to do those same things to us in the hope that he gets our attention. Because the immediate response, you would think, would be repentance, that Jacob would be like, oh, man, you know what? What you did to me, I did to my dad. That's a terrible thing to do. See, God will use people in our life to put back, bring back to us the things that we dish out. It's, the world calls it karma, uh, comeuppance, however you want to phrase it. Uh, you reap what you sow. That's what God says. And, and so here's a case where, where he has reaped what he sowed. And, and it's just, <laughs> you just hear him silent. He's got to sit in it. And it's a tough lesson. So let's talk about Leah. We've talked about Jacob and Laban and Rachel. Let's, let's look at Leah. We, we don't know a lot about Leah, except she had weak eyes. And, and Leah, in this time and, and culture, her name meant cow. All right? I know, I know you think that, and you're like, 
what a terrible name for a girl. Okay, and it is. Now, if I got Leah's here today, it means like beautiful meadow and woman of power. I don't, so <laughs> I'm just telling you back then, back then. But, but here was the reality. They, they, they named her <coughs> Leah, which meant cow. But uh, Rachel means you or lamb. So what you have is a very non-creative dad who lives on a farm. Oh, there's my daughter. I'll call her cow. Because cows are worth a lot of money. They're valuable. And uh, oh, here's another daughter. I'll call her sheep. Right? And if he had a son, he'd name him chicken. I don't, you know, it's just like, it's what he does. And, and so, but it has no, it, it, for us, we see that and we're like, oh man, what a terrible thing. But that's not what was in mind here. But the only thing that we know about her is that it says she had weak eyes. That does not mean she had bad vision. Okay, if she had bad vision, it would have said Leah had weak eyes and Rachel could see like an eagle, right? But it doesn't say that. It just says she had weak eyes. So <clears throat> what this is is most likely is her eyes were kind of dull, kind of plain. Uh, uh, in some instances, you know, with a, a, a woman who is, is very beautiful, their, their eyes kind of snap or there's something about their eyes that just makes them stand out. And uh, whatever this was... What the, what the writer is trying to communicate here is that Leah was homely. In, in comparison to her sister, Rachel, I mean, Rachel, it says that, that, that Rachel, says Leah's eyes in verse 17, Leah's eyes were weak, but, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. And, and that word form in Hebrew means, wow. I mean, she was just, Wow. And it's saying that Leah lived in the shadow of a beautiful, beautiful sister. And just the weight of comparison all the time. And now, now her father has to use deception in order to marry her off. She, her father has to trick a man into marrying her. Anybody get a sense that self-esteem here is not going to be very high? And, and so Leah, in her own right, is hurting. In, in a similar way as Jacob, she has that same void, that, that same pain, that same hollowness. And just as Jacob was looking to Rachel to meet that, and to find his identity in, in his relationship with her, here is Leah, and she's like, what am I going to do? And, and she comes to the realization, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a mother and I'm going to bear children. And that's where she seeks to find her identity, her purpose, everything. Is, and, and her thought, her understanding is this, is that, okay, here's the reality I'm dealing with, because it says that Jacob loved Rachel and not Leah. So she knows that's the reality. So she's like, I'm going to win my husband. And I'm going to do it by bearing children, because my sister can't have kids. It's going to be me. And, and you begin to see this unfold in the text. If you look at, at verse 31, <coughs> it says that, that when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. So Reuben means behold a son. She's like, God's seen my affliction. So he's like, see, here's a son. And she in turn, what she's counting on is, okay, you know what? I've given my husband a son, which in this culture was like the pinnacle of childbirth, was bearing a son. Now, now he's going to see me. Now my husband will take notice of me. But you know what? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. And so the scripture says that <laughs> she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard me or has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Simeon, the, the root word for Simeon means to, to hear. She's like, God's finally heard me. And now maybe because I've given my husband another son, now maybe he'll hear me too. Maybe he'll listen to me 
and recognized my value and my worth. Did it happen? No. So it goes on here in verse 34. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Levi means to attach. And she's like, you know what? If you won't love me, maybe because I've given him sons, he'll be attached to me. It's like just trying to force this. She's trying to find her, her meaning, her significance. And it's not until the fourth son where you see a heart change. I want you to look at verse 35. It says, And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. This is a very different instance, this son who was born. Just, just a couple things let me point out here that, that are kind of obscure in Scripture. Uh, but if you notice, she says, I will praise the Lord. Uh, in Genesis, there are basically two names of God used. One is, is Elohim, which is God, G-O-D. That's kind of the uh, general purpose name for God. Um, the other is Yahweh. That is God's personal name, his covenant name. Uh, the people who refer to Lord as Yahweh uh, do so because they believe in Him, who He is. They believe in His promises. She has made a transition. Now, now if you look starting at verse 31, you will see that she is calling on Yahweh through this whole time. But it's not until the fourth son <coughs> that you see something transition here. Notice she says, this time. This time, when I, have, when I have my son, this time, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to praise the Lord. This time, I'm going to praise the Lord. This time, in other words, I'm going to put my attention and my focus and my fulfillment being in, in, in my relationship with God and who God is and God's goodness. See, she, she gets it. She gets it here. And, and so she, she bears a son, and she, and she names him Judah. Judah. Uh, this to me is just such a picture of God's grace. Who, who is Judah? Who is Judah from this woman that, that no one wanted? Judah will be the line through which the Messiah comes. And in fact, in, in chapter 49, I'm reading from the Amplified uh, version here of the Bible. Jacob is, is or Isaac is, is <coughs> prophesying over, I'm sorry, Jacob is prophesying over his sons. And he says to Judah, he says, the scepter or leadership shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh, the Messiah, the peaceful one, comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And, and what he's saying is, is that this is where Jesus fits in. Through Leah, the one no one wanted, the one who was rejected. Isn't this just like God? He takes those who are rejected, those that, that the world casts to the side, the, the, the people that, that the world deems, you know, have no value. This is exactly how God works. He does that then, he does that now. See, when we look at this story, when we look at the overview of this story, with, particularly with Jacob and Leah, they, they are individuals who are searching. And all of us do this kind of searching. All of us have a tendency to, to take things that are good and to amplify them so that they are like the ultimate in our life. Motherhood, motherhood, great. It's a good thing. It's not the ultimate. The ultimate is knowing Jesus Christ. Sometimes we think if we have just that special relationship, we search for that, and we think, man, if we can just get that, that, that's a good thing, and we make it the ultimate, like our whole life depends on finding that one right person. That's what we do. See, in the end, that in, in all the searching that you and I do, we are actually searching for Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you don't recognize that. Maybe Because what we tend to see is we, we run from one thing to the next. 
And we're all guilty of this. We've all done that. We, we take things that are good and we just amplify them. And that's what our focus is. And, and what happens is, is that it leads to disappointment and devastation. Basically, we all end up having that, that moment that's in verse 25. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. I mean, what, what she is symbolic of here in, in this story is just this instance is the embodiment of disillusion and disappointment. Because when we run after anything else and we put anything else before God and who he is, it will end in disillusionment and disappointment. Now let me just land the plane here in this story, in this text. As we, as we went through this, was, was there any character, let, let's just name the four characters we have in here. We have um, uh, Jacob, uh, Rachel, Leah, Laban. Who's the spiritual hero here? Who's the, the person here that, that you're just like, man, when I grow up, I want to be just like Laban. I want to know how to cook a deal, right? Man, when I, when I grow up, I, I hope I can be like Jacob. I hope I can find that one woman to obsess over, all right? And I hope I'm like Rachel, who just gets filled with jealousy and bitterness towards her sister. Or Leah, who just tries to find all her meaning in just having kids. You see a spiritual hero here? There is none. See, this is what I love about Scripture. God puts stories out there. He puts us, gives us events that deal with real people, just like you and me. Just like you and me, because these are people who are weak and broken. And what I want you to see is that God still moves and God still works. And how many of us come out of backgrounds with messed up homes? How many of us come out of brokenness? Every one of us comes out of an area of brokenness. And what you have here is a story in which God uses broken people. So if you're here today and, and you sometimes wonder, can God ever use me? Can God ever bring good out of my past and where I've been and where I'm at now? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely yes. Doesn't matter what your past is. And in fact, you think about this story, doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. God deals with any age and any issue. And he works. And he's at work. If you're here today and you just struggle with the fact of, man, does God even love me? Yes. I know sometimes we, don't, we may not sense it and feel it, but, but as we look in Scripture, you see how God over and over uh, connects and meets with people that others in the world reject. Because we are valuable to God. We have value to Him. He loves us to that degree. You know, when you have that in mind, I think... Um, it just makes it, to me, when you, when you begin to think of that and think of the gospel, it just makes it easier just to thank him for, for loving you to that degree. I'm going to ask that the worship team come up, and we're going we're gonna to close out just focusing on, on God's love for us, that marvelous love. And I'm going to ask that you would stand, and let me pray for you uh, this morning. <coughs> Father God, um, as we close, I, I thank you uh, for, this, for this portion of text that deals with the reality of humanity, that deals with the reality of our, our sin condition, how there's such brokenness with it, and just things that are sown into lives, even our own lives, Father, that we may not have had anything to do with. It may have been the people who raised us or that we hung around um, and brokenness came with it. Or maybe we've made bad choices like we read about in Scripture and, and there's consequences and we reap what we sow. But Father, as damaged as we are, 
You know that. And you love us right where we're at. While we were still sinners, while we were still messed up and broken, you died for us. You don't ask us to make ourselves better and then come. You take us where we're at. You, you don't tell us, make yourself beautiful and then I'll love you. You love us and make us beautiful. We thank you for that kind of grace and that kind of love. In Jesus' name, amen.